that. John chapter four today is where I want to share with you as we continue the series, Making Heaven Full. And I want to, uh, I, today I want to share a, a familiar story. It's one I've taught before. It's one that uh, if you've been around church very much, you've probably heard about it before. John chapter four, the entire chapter really is dedicated to this story of Jesus' encounter with the woman at the well. And I want to look at her a little bit, but I also, I, I'm intrigued really, and, and I felt like God was really drawing me my attention to the disciples in this story. Um, and unfortunately, this is not their greatest moment. This is not their best hour. Um, and I'm so grateful that the scriptures don't offer up our heroes of faith as being perfect people and always getting it right. In fact, when you read the story and you look at the disciples, um, a lot of times you're like, like Jesus, you couldn't have picked some better guys? These, these scrubs, like, they don't get it. They are slow on the uptake. They, 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 they seem to never really quite get there. And Jesus is always like, how long am I going to have to be with you and have to always be fixing this stuff and, and, and turning you in the right direction? And this is yet another example. Um, and I, I, I say that um, and I share it with you because I'm concerned that we as disciples of Jesus may be struggling from the same thing that they were and failing maybe in the same ways that they did. John chapter four, the woman at the well, beginning with verse four, it says, now he, Jesus, had to go through Samaria. So he came to a, a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, it was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? And verse eight adds parenthetically, his disciples had gone into the town to buy food. Verse six tells us it was about noon. Verse eight tells us his disciples had gone into town to buy food. If you're writing down notes, you're a note taker, my title today is Out to Lunch, Out to Lunch. And in this story, we find in a moment that would be extremely consequential, not only in this one woman's life, but in the faith journey of an entire town, entire village, entire city, that in a moment when a massive number of people, their faith, their eternities, their experience with God was hanging in the balance. We find that the disciples, both literally and figuratively, were out to lunch. They were MIA. They were not just not there, even when they finally got there, they still weren't really there. And they almost missed this moment. And I just wanna challenge us as a church that in a moment when the world needs us the most, when things are getting worse and worse and worse, and the day is getting darker, that we're not out to lunch. So before we jump in, let's pray. Father, right now, we thank you for your word. I thank you, God, that you are able to feed the thousands with one lunch, that you are able to speak to thousands of people right now across locations, online, all of us with our own unique needs and troubles and concerns and burdens and hopes and dreams. And you can take one word, one message, and you can bless it and break it and you can give it. And every one of us can be satisfied. Every one of us can be encouraged. Every one of us can be challenged. So God, would you do that miracle again today? Break it and feed us and let every one of us get exactly what we need today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, let's jump in. I love this story. I, I love this story. There's a lot of layers to this story, and many, many of which we can't really even get into today. Um, at the heart of the story, of course, is this place called Samaria, um, and this people, this group, people group, the Samaritans. Um, of, of course, the, the background, the very quick background is that uh, Jewish people and Samaritan people, um, well, they don't get together, get together very well, and they don't, they don't get along very well. Um, and there's a lot of backstory and a lot of history, but Samaria represents a different ethnic group, a different religious perspective. 
um, as well as geographical and national kind of boundary crossing. And so um, that's why when Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan, when he casts the protagonist in that story, when he casts the hero of that story, he makes the hero of this story a Samaritan person who Jews would just assume would be not the hero, not the protagonist, but the antagonist. Um, that the, 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 uh, the Samaritan would be the bad guy in the story because Samaritans are bad guys. And so Jesus flips it on his head and makes the person, the, uh, or a person from the people group that they would assume would be um, those kinds of people actually the hero of the story. Jesus, the Bible says, had to go through Samaria. Now, this is not a geographical necessity. In fact, Jewish people did not have to, nor did they frequently go through Samaria. Uh, Samaria was geographically, if you, they're down around Jerusalem and they're going to go back to Galilee. Galilee is where they're from. And many times you'd find them, uh, they're in one of those two places. They're all, Jesus is always either in Galilee uh, ministering there, or he's down in Jerusalem, generally around a festival time, a feast time, uh, because it would have been expectation and uh, even religious obligation for Jewish, uh, particularly Jewish men to come to Jerusalem for the feast. And so Jesus was always kind of back and forth from the North Galilee to the the South Jerusalem. And in between the two is a place called Samaria. And if you go directly due north of Jerusalem on the way up to Galilee, there right in the middle of the two is Samaria. The problem is that the Jewish people not only didn't like the Samaritans, they believed that they were unclean and that they would defile them. Just walking through their towns would defile them. And so Jewish people um, who were going to or from Jerusalem, up to Jerusalem or coming back down from Jerusalem, um, would circumnavigate Samaria. And so you would normally, if you wanted to, the, the, the fastest point, uh, uh, away from point A to point B, straight line, but they wouldn't walk in a straight line. Instead of going just straight due north, they would go north a little bit, and then they'd go east, and they would cross over a river, the Jordan River, and then they would go north on the other side of the Jordan River, and then at some point, once they got past uh, uh, where Samaria was, they would go west and cross back over the Jordan River, and then finish the journey north to Galilee. That's a whole lot of like adding days to their journey, just because we hate you so much. I hate you so much. I am going to make, you know, like a one day trip into a three day trip, but this was common practice. And yet Jesus in this moment refuses to go around and instead he has to go through. And I just want to tell you this. There are times when you just have to go through. There, there are places and moments that if you are going to walk in your purpose, Jesus' purpose is going to be found at this well. And sometimes we miss our purpose because we refuse to go through hard places. And we try to circumnavigate adversity and things that make us uncomfortable. But your purpose will be found oftentimes when you're going through the discomfort instead of going around it. I wonder what things that we're avoiding. I wonder what people and places and opportunities and things that we have been avoiding because they're uncomfortable or they're hard. And could it be that our purpose is hidden, the purpose at the pit stop in the middle of going through something that I really would rather not even have to go through? And Jesus is going through and he stops. And I love this because he sits down at the well, tired as he was. And I just love the picture of tired, exhausted Jesus. I mean, I'm not glad he's exhausted, but I am glad that we, we don't have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities and our weaknesses, but in every way was tempted like as we are yet without sin. So Jesus got tired. We see, we see Jesus in his humanity. And uh, it was only noon though, and um, they hadn't been traveling that far because they were not taking the long route around. They were taking the direct route through. And so in some respects, Jesus maybe shouldn't have been tired yet. And yet he seems exhausted. The disciples have gone to buy some food. They've gone to town. I don't know this for a fact. I can't prove this, but um, I just, in my mind, um, I think Jesus sent them to town. Maybe. I think, I think Jesus may have at least planted the idea, you know, inception, like you, you're, you're not hungry, but I'm going to like, Hey, you guys look hungry. No, we ate breakfast, you know, an hour ago. No, y'all really look hungry. They got some good, you know, some good food here in Samaria and whatever. And, they, and finally they're like, you know what? Yeah, maybe we'll go get some food, right? And so they go to town. And I feel like that, like the disciples roll out and Jesus sits down in the well and he's like, ah, finally. Any of you got kids? You know what I'm talking about. If you got kids, you know what I'm talking about. It's like, you know, and then like they go to school or somebody comes, picks them up or whatever it is. And you're just like, oh God. Like 
I love you, but I need a minute away from you. And the, the disciples are like children. They, in fact, they, in some ways, they are kind of children. They, many scholars believe the disciples were exceptionally young, younger than I think we oftentimes assume. In fact, uh, scholars uh, often believe that, that the apostle Peter was the only disciple that was over the age of 30. Um, and there's reason why there's a time when Jesus, uh, Peter says, we got to pay our temple tax. And Jesus makes a miracle. They pull a fish out of the water. It's got two coins, which would have been enough of a temple tax for two adult males over 30. And yet they're paying the temple tax for all the disciples which indicates that only two of the disciples, Jesus and Peter, were 30 years older, which is a whole aside. But let me just say, Jesus was not afraid to empower young leaders. Well, I just, I don't know about all these young whippersnappers. Well, Jesus built the church, handed the keys of the kingdom to a bunch of 20-somes. And in fact, probably teenagers. In fact, scholars almost universally agree that John would have been the youngest of the disciples. And he was probably a teenager, not even like 18, 19, but like 14 or 15. John the apostle, John the disciple of Jesus. The, 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 the followers of Jesus are teenagers and 20-somethings. Which means they were kids. Like, you got teenagers? If you got teenagers, you're going to be tired too. And you know, they were like, they were, I mean, they were. You look at the Jesus relationship with them and he loved them. But man, that, you wonder why Jesus was always going up on the mountain to get alone to pray? Because he had, I mean, he didn't have kids, but he had kids. Come on, it's why, you, it's why you go to the bathroom when you don't have to use the bathroom and lock the door. Mama, what are you doing? <laughs> Leave me alone. Y'all go get something to eat, you know? And Jesus is now sitting at the well, and he's just like, oh, God, finally, I just need a minute. He's got to wear me out. And as Jesus is resting, as he is sitting and resting in his physical weariness, all of a sudden, a woman shows up, and verse 7 says she came to draw. In this moment, Jesus is going to do something significant, and I want to highlight it here. I don't think it's an accident. She came to get and notice Jesus' response. Let's put it back on the screens. The woman came to draw water, but Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? So she comes to get something, and Jesus asked her instead, will you give something? Jesus is in the process right now to not only reorient this woman, but also the disciples. Because all of this story I want to show you is is a call to reorient ourselves away from a constant pursuit of getting something to a lifestyle of giving something. Uh, this woman lives a lifestyle const in a constant pursuit to uh, get, she's thirsty and she's literally thirsty. She's coming to the well, but she is also thirsty in more ways than one because we will find out in a minute that she, um, she has been with already five husbands and she's currently with a man who's not her husband. She's shacking with a man who's not her husband and all that's going to come out in the conversation. This woman is thirsty. This woman is thirsty for water and she's also thirsty. Come on. She's, she's thirsty for a man. She's thirsty for, um, wh whether it's, uh, just, uh, the, the companionship, uh, marriage, wh whatever it may be, the sexual encounter, whatever it is, she's gone from man to man, to man, to man, to man, to man. And every day she goes to the well, to the well, to the well, to the well. And here again, she goes to the well, she's coming to get water. Jesus is going to offer though here, her here, uh, an alternative. He said, if you drink Drink this water, you'll get thirsty again. He's not just talking about the well, he's talking about the man. He's talking about everything that she chases after to satisfy her thirst, to satisfy herself. And it doesn't have to be water and it doesn't have to be a man. It can be money, it can be, it can be a career, it can be uh, relationships, it can be uh, power, it can be, it can be entertainment, it can be whatever it is. And the, the, here's the basic message in that is that whatever it is, if whatever it is isn't God, it's never going to be enough. So you drink it, but you get thirsty again, right? You, you hook up, but you get thirsty again, or, or you make more money. You know, you know, some of you right now are making, you're making the amount of money that you used to think if I ever made that much money, it would be enough. And guess what? You want more. You're, you're still thirsty. And this is true with anything that is not God. Cause at the end of the day, you were created to be fulfilled through this relationship with the creator and nothing else. I'm not saying they're bad things. I'm just saying they're not ultimate ends. And they cannot fully satisfy your soul. They will not fully satisfy your thirst. You'll get thirsty again. So she had the first husband. It didn't work out. She's like, well, the next one, 
It'll be different next time. Come on, some of y'all said the same thing. <laughs> and at some point she realized it's not different this time. And she's been married five times. Like at some point you got to look in the mirror and say, I have to be a part of this somehow. I don't know if I'm a terrible wife or I'm a terrible picker of husbands. But something's going on here, and yet she does. She just keeps on the on the on the wheel, and she just keeps going to the next thing, the next man, the next the next well, the next tap, the next whatever it can be. Again, it's maybe it's a drink, maybe it's maybe it's an accomplishment, an achievement, maybe it's maybe it's the a bigger house, a nicer car, whatever it can be. You can be chasing, you mean chasing the next drink. It's funny because the word Sakar, the city where they're in, literally means drunken. So he's in a town where people are known for chasing the next drink, literally. And here comes, comes this woman ch chasing her next drink. And Jesus turns it on his head and says, I know you came here to make a withdrawal, to draw out, but I'm asking you to make a deposit. I know that you came here to get something. That's, all, that's, that's what drives your life, getting the next whatever it is that you want, getting more, getting my what. And again, it can be anything, but you want to get, 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 get. And you think you can fill yourself by getting more. And then you get it, and you're even more empty than you were before. And you need more on top of the more. Come on, some of you swore, man, man, if I just, whatever. And some of you are like, man, if I got married, I'd just be so happy. <laughs> How's that working for you? I'm... I'm not saying don't be married or don't stay married. I'm just saying if you think that the ultimate answer is anything that I get, if I get this, then it'll be, it's, I'm, I'm just, and sometimes, listen, you can listen to me and I think you listen to the word of God. I think there's wisdom in learning from other people's mistakes, or you can just keep living and keep chasing and keep being disappointed and keep getting thirsty and keep needing more. And at some point you're like, I'm tired of living like this. And Jesus said, there's another way. And so he turns this on his side and shows that fulfillment doesn't come from getting, but from giving. That's why Jesus said there's more blessing in giving than receiving. She says, I, I, I'm here to withdraw, to get. Jesus said, will you give? And a conversation ensues. She is shocked that Jesus would even talk to her. Jesus is breaking all kinds of traditions and protocols, and this is completely taboo. And I love Jesus' willingness to cross lines and break borders and annoy religious people and meet broken and hurting people right where they were. I love it. And, he, and he's having a conversation. She's like, I can't even believe you're talking to me because you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. You're a man and I'm a woman. All this stuff and all this baggage and all this history and all of this stuff. And they're having a conversation. The woman begins to wax theological, you know, and I clearly, I mean, she's like, she's bouncing from one man to the next, right? So she ain't quite living it, but she, this is like some of you. Some of y'all, y'all ain't living it, but you can quote more scripture than, you know, the preacher. She, so she's like, well, we, we uh, Samaritans believe this and this and this, and they're having this theological debate, you know. At some point, Jesus says, hey, hey, how about you do me a favor? Um, you know, so we don't just have this conversation one-on-one. -on -one. Why don't you go call your husband? Jesus, he knows what he's doing. He's not ignorant. She's like, um... Well, I actually, I actually, I'm not married. He was like, no, you're right. You're right. You've been married five times. And the guy you're with right now, he ain't put a ring on it yet. You're right. <laughs> She's like, um, I perceive that you're a prophet. <laughs> right. And all of a sudden, so they're having this conversation and Jesus, and Jesus is, uh, the Bible says, uh, we beheld his glory full of grace and truth. And Jesus is the perfect combination. Grace and truth go together. They are two sides of the same Jesus coin. They are not at odds with each other. Uh, love and truth are two sides of the same coin. So Jesus is gracious, but he's also truthful. So, he, so he'll, drop the, he'll drop the truth bomb on her. He'll be like, you're right. You've been with so many men. You're like, you just, you, at this point, you don't, you don't even bother getting married, right? And she's like, ah, oh, ouch. I got, you know, but he's also full of grace. She never feels judged. She never feels rejected. And so they're having this conversation and this conversation's moving. At some point she gets to this place. She said, well, we, you know, we believe that one day the Messiah is going to come and he's going to straighten all this out. And one day Messiah will show up and, and he'll, he'll, he'll tell us who's right, you know, because they're arguing about some religious stuff. And Jesus said, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. the Messiah, that guy that you're waiting on. Hello? I'm he, right? And it is like, it is like the moment, it's like every head bowed, every eyes closed. It's like that moment. They've had this conversation going on and they've been uh, sparring about, you know, 
politics and religion and, and Jesus has been breaking down the walls and, and, and finally he's revealing to her who he is. I am the one you've been waiting for. You've been chasing all this men, but you are face to face with the one that you really, the ultimately that you really need most. And I am the answer. And I'm like, I'm the Messiah. And, and it's like, she's about to raise her hand. She's, you know, just like this moment. And you know what happens? The disciples show back up. Now, you parents know, you know, you know. Your kids are have a, they got a way of showing up when you least expect or least want them. Come on. You think they're in bed? Hey, mama. And then all of a sudden, you thought you had a little alone time, a little mama daddy time. And then here they are. I thought you locked the door. Show up at the worst time. Here come the disciples, right? And, and she's like right there. He's revealing who he is. And this is a moment. And they show up. And the Bible says that, that all of a sudden they come back. They show back up. Um, she, um, verse 27, his disciples returned. They were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Because they were worried about what he may say. Jesus? Especially this woman. There have been a lot of men who've wanted something from this woman and gotten it. Jesus? But they, they thought it, but they didn't say it. This kind of woman? Then leaving her jar, verse 28, the woman went back to the town. Now I find it really uh, challenging that, Jesus, that, that, that this woman was very comfortable in the presence of Jesus, but very uncomfortable in the presence of the disciples. And some of you understand that. Some of you don't have a problem with Jesus, but it's when you get around church people, they didn't say it, but she felt it. They didn't say, Jesus, this woman, this kind of woman, they never articulated it with their mouths, but she felt it in her spirit. They cut the eyes. Come on, y'all, some of y'all been to church. Y'all went to that church. <laughs> And, 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 and like, I don't have a problem with Jesus, but it's these people who say they follow Jesus and all of a sudden she's, she's out. She leaves her pot, which is, I think, significant, the mechanism for her to get what she thought she needed and what she wanted. She drops it. She runs back into town. And the Bible says now she's not going back to town to get something, but to give something. She says to them, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. So now she takes the good news she just got and gives it away. Could this be the Messiah? And they came out and made their way toward him. So the whole town is now coming out from the town, out toward the well where Jesus is. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, verse 31, Rabbi, eat something. They had gone out to lunch. They had gotten something to eat and they were smart enough not to come back empty handed. So they were like, you know, hey Jay, we got, and I don't know what they got. I don't know what they, but in my mind they had five guys. And this is when you know it's five guys. You, you, in fact, if I go on this side, that's, you see that right there, that little dot? That's the, they put a dot on the bird. When you can, like, I can read the number. It's the number two. That's so much grease in this bag. This, at some point, this bag is going to just fall apart. Now, now let, let, let's, let's lay this out there, though. The Hebrew word for anointing comes from the Hebrew word for oil. So I'm just gonna say, I think I preach better. So I, that's, that's my excuse. If I, have, if I get some grease, I'll be more anointed, literally. Um, I love five guys, so I don't know. I, I think Jesus, it was probably like a Sunday, right? And Chick-fil-A was closed, because we all know that if, if Chick-fil-A was open, Jesus was gonna be eating that Chick-fil-A chicken. Now that's Jesus chicken. That's that saved chicken. Right, and so, and so Jesus probably ate Chick-fil-A for breakfast and lunch and dinner, sweet tea, you know, he did the whole thing. Um, but it was a Sunday and they're like, what are we gonna do? And so they're like, you know what? The one thing Jesus, if he ain't in Chick-fil-A, he hit some five guys. They got some five guys, they roll in. They're like, Jesus, listen, hey, um, I know we just kind of messed up your altar call right there, but hey, we brought you five guys. And I'll be honest with you, you can mess up my altar call if you bring me five guys, we're gonna be all right, you know what I'm saying? But he said to them, I have food that you, uh, to eat that you know nothing about. I already got food. And they said to each other, who brought him food? <laughs> I didn't think DoorDash came this far out. Like, 
I didn't think you could Uber Eats to the well, where, you know, address, the, Jacob's well. Where did he get food from? And Jesus' response is gonna show us, um, I think three things the disciples were lacking, three reasons why they were failing to make heaven full, three, reason, three things that we need if we're going to. And the first thing that Jesus shows them, he said, my food, because they're like, where'd you get food from? What's your food? Who brought you food? Who brought, you know, we were out there getting food for you. Somebody else made a delivery. Who brought you food? And Jesus says in verse 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And so the first thing the disciples lack that Jesus has is an unseen source. Jesus says, I have a secret stash. Now again, parents, if you got kids, if you don't know about this, let me go ahead and tell you. You need to have like, you need to have the place where the kids' snacks are, but then you need another place where your snacks are. You gotta, I'm just gonna be honest, because otherwise they will eat all your good stuff. And so Jesus, you know, they're like, we brought you some food. He said, I'm good. They were like, what are you talking about? You love five guys, man. They, they hand cut those fries. Like I, got, they, like, I saw the bag. I know exactly what farm out of I, Idaho those rusted potatoes came from. You don't get any fresher than that, Jesus. These, these fries will make you slap your mama, Jesus. <laughs> he was like, I've never slapped Mary, and I'll ne I never will. They said, I know, but for real, they're good. Like, these burgers, Jesus. He's like, come on, they got the, they got, we got you the grilled onions and the mushrooms. And, come on. Like, G -G and he was like, no, no, I got food. They said, what food? He's like, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me. The thing that sustains me and strengthens me, the thing I, I, I live for is not for my next drink or my next bite, but it's my next, the next part of my purpose. I am, I am propelled by my purpose, not my palate. I'm fed by something else. I have a different source than you have. And, and I, I love this because in this story, everybody else is chasing fulfillment. She is thirsty, so she run into the well. They are hungry, so they're leaving the well and they're running to the town. In fact, they likely cross paths in the process. Meanwhile, I find it so interesting that the disciples judge her thirstiness, not just obviously her physical thirst, but also her, you know, other thirst. They judge her thirst and yet they are motivated by hunger. They, they, their motivation, now, now, now they have a different appetite specifically, but they are still motivated by a base appetite, a base desire. This is the way judgmental people are. Like you struggle with a different sin, so I'll judge you for your sin, but I got my own thing that I'm chasing. I don't chase a drink, I chase a burger, I don't chase, you know. And then, and, then, and then here's what's always fun too. When, when people want the preacher to preach about the stuff other people's chasing, but not the thing they are. They preach against this sin, but all of a sudden you get on theirs. I, no, I, I, I thought about going there. I just, and so, and so everybody is chasing something. Everybody, she's running toward the well. They're running toward the five guys shop. Jesus is the only one that's not chasing anything because he has already a source inside of him. But Paul gives this scathing mic drop moment in his letter to the Philippians. We talked about Philippians chapter three last, last week. Paul says, forgetting the things that are behind, I press on. And we talked about our need as a church not to just get caught up in the winds of the past, but the why of our present and what God's called us to do in this next season. And immediately after he says that, he says, for I have, Philippians 3, 18, for I've told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, I, I, I need us to settle here for long enough to recognize that Paul is not talking about outsiders here. He says, with tears in my eyes, I'm telling you that there are many, there, your words don't say this, your, your Instagram posts don't say this, 
But your conduct says that the reality is not the image, not what you project, not what you with your mouth identify, but your conduct says that you are in truth, not, not uh, uh, working for the mission of Jesus, but you're working against the mission of Jesus. You're an enemy to the cross of Christ and they are headed for destruction. Well, what kind of crazy things must these people be doing? Their God is their Five guys. I mean, not literally. Their God is their appetite. And again, we're not talking about physical hunger. We're talking about any base, the desire of our flesh. It can be food, it can be drink, it can be sex, it can be power, it can be money, it can be achievement, it can be greed, it can be, it can be, uh, there's a whole host of things that we want and, and they are driven by their appetite. Their God is their, some translations say their God is their belly, their God is their stomach, their God is that part of them that just does, and when they want something, they just go get it. They brag about excuse me, shameful things. And here it is. They only think about this life here on earth. And here's my concern. The disciples are out to lunch. And I think that a lot of us who sit in the church, and here's how you know it. You're motivated by the same things that everybody in the world's motivated by. So she's motivated, like she's, th she's chasing after an appetite. And meanwhile, they, they're judging her, but they're chasing after their own appetite and not motivated by the purpose of God. Motivated by momentary impulses, motivated by, by natural desire instead of supernatural calling. With no concept about like living life just for here and now, acting like this is all there is. And listen, if, there is, if this is all there is, you might as get, well get all the five guys you can get. There's nothing wrong with five guys. The problem's not with five guys. The problem is when, when you trade the things that matter most for things that are fleeting and passing, that you'll eat today and you'll be hungry again tomorrow. You'll drink today, you'll be thirsty again tomorrow. You'll make some money today, you'll need to make more money tomorrow. You, you'll, you'll hook up today, but you'll be ready to hook up again tomorrow. And, you, and you'll trade things that last forever for things that don't. This is the curse of Esau in the Old Testament. There's a guy named Esau, and he literally trades away an eternal birthright because he was hungry and his brother was making some stew. And he said, I'll give you, I'll give you something that will last forever if you'll give me that bowl because I'm so hungry right now. And it sounds ridiculous, but there's so many of us who live for the moment and we miss the thing that actually matters. Jesus said, I'm, I am filled not when I satisfy myself, but when I serve others, when I live for something that's more than here and now. I've got a secret source, an unseen source. Here's the second thing. He said, and don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest? Well, I tell you, open your eyes and look to the fields. They are ripe for harvest. He said, y'all always, they got you a little idiom. You got a little colloquialism, a little saying here. Y'all always saying like four months and then the harvest. It was just a little saying. They didn't make it up. It was just a common phrase that they would use. Don't y'all don't say four months in the harvest? They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> I say to you, it's now or never. Here's the second thing we've got to have, an urgent outlook. The disciples lacked any sense of urgency. The disciples had this attitude like they got all the time in the world to do the work of God. The disciples have no sense of urgency. And I wonder how many of us are procrastinating on our purpose, punting on our purpose, putting off our purpose to, to when it's a better time and it fits better in our schedule. And, and, and one day maybe I'm going to do something and I'm going to serve and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to minister and I'm going to give and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it. About, I'm going to do that. But right now, uh, you know, I got, I, got my, I got to go get my five guys. And Jesus says, open your eyes. And when they looked, he said, open your eyes and look. And when they looked, they saw harvest. He was not pointing them to fields. He was pointing them to the people, to the town that had left the town coming out to the well. The whole town was coming to Jesus. And Jesus said, you're talking about, we got all the time in the world. And I'm telling you, open your eyes. Here, the harvest is here. And they look up and they see a town full of people, but not just a random town full of people. These are not, these are not people they have never seen. I know that these are not people they had never seen because they were just in the same town getting fed. 
They walked through the streets of this very, they, like among the people in the group was the guy behind the counter at Five Guys. Jesus said, I, I sent you into town, partly because y'all are get on my nerves and I wanted a minute. But I sent you into the town because there's work I want to do in the town, because there's people I want to save in the town. So I sent, what am I going to do? I'm going to send my boys. I'm going to send my crew. I'm going to send P Peter. He's going to be the rock of the church. I'm going to send John, the beloved. I'm going to send Andrew and Philip and Nathaniel, Bartholomew, my guys. If anybody's going to go and tell them about me, it's these guys, my guys. So I sent my guys, and you walked right through that town, and you went and filled your stomach, and you didn't say a word about me to anybody. Open your eyes. You, you think I sent you there? You think you work at that job just to, just to bring home a bag? I sent you. I, I sent you. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. Get the five guys. Make money. Pay for your, you know, house and, and put food on the table. Do all of that. But that's not your purpose. Your purpose isn't just to keep running the rat race, a hamster on a wheel, live day by day by day until you die. He said, I, I sent you into that town for a reason, and you completely miss it. You were out to lunch. The, the phrase out to lunch can also mean a person who is unaware or inattentive of present conditions. And so there was purpose all around you, and you were out to lunch. There was opportunity right in front of you, and you were out to lunch. You had a chance to share the good news, but you were out to lunch. You could have made heaven full, but you were more concerned about making your belly full, and you were out to lunch. And I wonder how many of us live our lives to fill ourselves instead of filling heaven. We go through our days and we just live our life from the next meal to the next, the next, the next well to the next, the next fix to the next, the next thing I get to fill me up and satisfy me to the next. And we punt on purpose. We procrastinate on the very thing God has called us to do. And Jesus said, y'all acting like you got all this time and I'm telling you, it's now or never. I'm almost done. I told, I've told this story before. I'm gonna tell it again though. It's a good story. It's a true story. My, my father-in-law moved down here um, and he wanted to start a garden, a vegetable garden. He'd never really done a vegetable garden before. So, my, you know, I'm, I'm, I grew up on a farm. My, my family was raised, you know, uh, cattle and stuff, but also had like acres of gardens and stuff like that. And so my dad was helping him out and like he'd get him some seed and help him out and different things. And so uh, my father-in-law, Larry, was, his first garden was coming along and he was really proud of it. So anytime I came over, because he knew, I, you know, I grew up on a farm, he, he wanted me to come see his handiwork. You know, he's proud of what he's just saying. He's like, hey, come look at my tomato plants. Come look at whatever. I'd be like, man, these look great, whatever. So one day, I hadn't been over there a while. One day he, he said to him, he said, I want you to show, I, come, come see my garden. I want, to, I want to show you my beans. I said, okay. He's planting green beans. And so we walk out there. And, and, and I'm walking out there, and I can see the beans from, like, the minute I, I, I come out the door. Beans are, like, this high off the ground. I mean, they look amazing-looking bean plants. And they're covered with green beans. Covered with them. And I said, man, look at all those. Like, those plants are dropping, with, like, just about to fall over with all them beans. He's like, yeah, he's like, they really did good. And he's really proud. And we walk over there and I look at him. I got close to him. Every bean on every bush was yellow. These are green beans, but they are yellow beans. Half of them are like now got black spots on them and stuff. And I look at him and he's looking at him like, he's proud of this thing. I look at him, he said, he said, he said, I did pretty good. I said, well, you did good when you planted them. You did good when you watered them. You did good when you fertilized them. I said, but you didn't do good when it was came time to pick them. I was like, these, what, I was like, these beans should have been picked weeks ago. They're real, like, you can't eat these. These are, these are trash, all of them. I was like, what, why didn't you pick them when they were ready? He said, he said, well, this is true. He said, well, I was going to, but Diane, this is his wife, he's like, but Diane told me we didn't eat them yet. We weren't ready for him. She didn't want any green beans right now. So I just left him. I said, Larry, it doesn't work that way. 
When the beans are ready, you don't get to tell the beans, hey, I'm going to put you on pause for a minute. I'm going to come back when, when I want to make some beans and be ready. When the beans are ready, you better be ready. You better get ready. That's the way it is with the harvest that God is trying to send in these last days. We don't get to look at the world and be like, hey, we're not ready right now. Y'all just hold on a minute. No, it's now or never. We will either reap the harvest or the harvest will be ruined. We'll either accomplish our purpose in this hour or we will miss this moment. Jesus said, we must do the work of him who sent me while there's still light. The, the night comes when no man can work. And I'm gonna just tell you, the night's on the way. It's not getting brighter out there, it's getting darker. So we have to have an urgency. And the last thing the disciples didn't have before we close, in fact, Nick, come help me, help me hush. Verse 36, Jesus creates an awareness of something else. He says, even now, right now, Y'all talking about four months. I'm talking about right now. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower, that is God, Jesus has said in another place, he that sows the seeds is, the, is God sowing the gospel so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. I sent you to reap. Jesus had an awareness of, the disciples were lacking a sense of an eternal reward, an eternal reward, that it is going to be worth it. If this life is all there is, then get the bag, secure the bag at all costs. And listen, I'm, I'm not saying don't get the bag. I'm, not, I'm, I'm gonna go eat five guys again today probably. <laughs> I'm not saying don't go to five guys. I'm saying stop living your life for five guys. And I ain't talking about five guys. I'm talking about all the other stuff that drives us. Money, you money, you want to live your whole life to make money? It's with you. It, it doesn't. All everything you see right now, all of this, everything you're working for, you're you're slaving for, you're worrying about, you're all this stuff, none will be here in hundred years. Two hundred years. It's all gone and the stuff that actually lasts look around look around every location look around the only thing that you're looking at right now that lasts are the people in this room none of this other stuff so you gotta start living your life for the reward that matters this is what Jesus said in Mark chapter 10 he said I assure you I promise you this, that everyone who has given up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or property or five guys, for my sake and for the good news. Now again, it's not the brothers or sisters or mothers or father or children or property or five guys, businesses or money or relationships, not that any of those are in and of themselves bad, but it's that when you are motivated and driven by your appetite, you live your life just for more, 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 more. First of all, you don't, it doesn't end up the way you think it is. You, li you spend your life grabbing and you en end up empty handed. So here's what he said, those people who give up, who, who, hey, I know you came to make a withdrawal. Let me challenge you to make a deposit. I know you came to get something. Would you give me a drink? That the people who begin to live their lives like that, verse 29, they will receive now in return, a hundred times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, property, fries, burgers. What? The way to actually get what you want is not to grab what you want. If you want to get it, you got to give it. That's what he's saying. You want fulfillment? You don't get fulfillment by trying to fill yourself. You get fulfillment by filling others. You get fulfillment by filling heaven. Like the... the, the Everything that you want, the way to get that is not to spend your life trying to get it, it's trying to give it away. And in the world to come, that person will have eternal life. Revelation 22, the end of the book, last chapter of the last book, Jesus says, look, I'm coming soon and my reward is with me. And I will give to each person according to what they have done. And I'm worried that the church has been out to lunch. And I'm worried that when we stand before Jesus and we will stand before Jesus, Hey, I sent you, I sent you into the town. 
I sent you into that job. I sent you into, I, I sent you into this season. I, I planted you in the most consequential, most important moment in human history. I put you right here because I was like, who am I going to put? I'm, I'm talking about like the night is coming. These are the last moments of daylight where work can be done. Who am I going to plant into history? And God chose you. And he put you here and he planted you here. What's the harvest? What'd you get? Who'd you bring? Who did you, who did you tell? Whose life was changed? Whose eternity is impacted? Who is in heaven today because I sent you to town? Show me what you got. You want a burger? Jesus is like, I don't, again, I don't, Jesus ain't like, hey, don't, don't, don't make any money. Don't get money, but don't, don't own anything. Don't let anything own you. Don't punt on purpose because you're chasing, fleeting, momentary, inconsequential things. He said, I'm coming back and I've got a reward. And people who live a life of true significance realize that this is not all there is. And I, I, I will sacrifice here and now to invest in there and then a lasting, eternal legacy. The story ends, the Bible says, all the Samaritans come. They heard from this woman. They came and saw for themselves. And sure enough, they spend some time with Jesus and they leave saying, he's the one. All of us, the whole town had been going from one drink to the next, quite literally. But he's the one who gives us, he said, if you let me, I'll give you a well, not a drink, I'll give you a source that springs up into everlasting life so that wherever you go, I'm not looking for fulfillment. I bring fulfillment with me. I'm not looking for love, I bring it with me. I'm not looking for affirmation, I bring it with me. I've got a secret source. I want us to pray. Eyes are closed. About, heads are bowed in this moment. I just want to across all of our locations. Let me pray for you before we leave. In the story, there's two people or two groups of people, the Samaritans and the disciples, the woman and her crew and the followers of Jesus. And maybe in this, in this moment, the person you identify most with is this woman. Maybe you've been chasing something, someone disappointed by people by promises, by things that you thought would give you joy, give you significance, satisfy your heart, fulfill you deeply. And it's not that they were bad things, they were just not ultimate things. And you have chased enough and you have been disappointed enough to realize this is dumb. I don't wanna spend my whole life chasing the next drink go into the well again and again and again, changing their names, but hope, hoping somehow that it changes the outcome. But instead, I want that thing that Jesus talked about, that I'll put the source in you. I'll become your source. You don't have to chase anything. If you're here today, you say, Tim, that's me and that's what I need and that's what I want today. I'm gonna pray with you. Our campus pastors at every location are coming to help us close in just a moment. But I'm gonna ask you this, if that's you, you say, Tim, today, I need, I need that thing that Jesus offered, this woman in this story. I'm gonna count to three, and if it's you, I just want you to shoot your hand up. Nobody's looking around. We're not gonna call you up or embarrass you. I just wanna pray for you. On the count of three, you say, Tim, today, I, I want that water. I want the thing that lasts. I want real fulfillment. If that's you, on the count of three, shoot your hand up. One, two, three. All over the place. Yeah, 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 all the way in the back, every row. You can put them down. I just pray this in your heart while I pray it out loud. Come on, just talk to God for a minute. God, right now, thank you. Thank you that while I was chasing it, you were chasing me. Thank you that when I was trying to find fulfillment in every other place, 
you were continuing to call my name, draw me to yourself, to the one thing that can fill that God-shaped hole that's in my heart that all of us were born with, that all of us experience. So right now, God, we just say yes to your grace. We receive the gift of life. We receive the well of water. Forgive us and wash us and cleanse us and let today be the start of a new life. We put our faith in you for that. In Jesus' name. And God, for those of us who are following you, disciples of Jesus, God forbid that we spend our lives, our short lives on this earth, filling our stomachs, filling our bank accounts, filling ourselves and not filling heaven. God forbid that we procrastinate on purpose because we're chasing things that are fleeting and ultimately don't satisfy. God, I pray today that we would live our life to do the work of the one who sent us and finish his work. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen.